very much. And it's been an incredible sort of uh, uh, presentation by Dr. Gibson that really has made my presentation much more, uh, I would say, uh, within a context, particularly with regards to the fact that we're going to talk about clotting, but in a different uh, vascular system. Before, we were talking about clotting in the veins and clotting in the lung circulation. Now we're talking about clotting in the systemic arterial circulation with particular focus on the um, uh, carotids. Now, uh, going back, um, everybody has a knowledge of what a stroke is, but I think that in this context, we want to make sure we have a more precise uh, knowledge of what the uh, current definition is. So stroke is classically defined as a neurological deficit that is attributed to an acute focal injury of the central nervous system by a vascular cause. We want to stress the vascular cause because you can have a focal injury from a trauma, but that's not a stroke. Now, the mechanisms of injury include two main uh, uh, fields, the cerebral infarction and the intracerebral hemorrhage. Now, what is a cerebral infarction? First of all, an infarction is a death of tissue that is triggered by the lack of of blood flow, and this is due to the fact that a vessel that is functionally terminal has been blocked. And this is what happens when we have a cerebral infarction. We have two main mechanisms recognized for cerebral infarction. One is artery to artery embolism. I want to bring your attention here to the inlet. We can see that there is a plaque, and over the plaque there is a clot that has formed. This is a clot, the same concept as the clot that forms in the vein. And the clot may remain attached to the plaque, and sometimes we can even see it with the ultrasound. But then the clot may dislodge. There is a high blood flow here, and if the clot dislodges, it travels through this brain circulation. And when it reaches one of the terminal branches that does not have a, enough space to accommodate the passage of the clot, the blood flow stops, and that causes an ischemic damage and a stroke. Now, the stroke uh, may occur from a clot that is not coming from the, uh, for another vessel, but may be coming from another structure within the circulatory system. In particular, we have the heart, and the heart may if, uh, act as a, a trigger for clots, and the clots may form in the upper chambers, or may form on the bowels, or may form within the lower chamber. What happens is that it's similar to the arteries. When the clot dislodges, it enters the circulation and ends up in a vessel in the brain and causes the damage. Now, another possible cause of stroke uh, that we are not going to discuss tonight is the possibility of a hemorrhage. And the hemorrhage usually occurs because one of the small arteries in the brain has been damaged frequently by long-standing high blood pressure, and then it burst, and the damage is caused by the pressure from the bursting of the vessel into the tissue. Now, uh, stroke is unfortunately very common. In uh, ischemic infarction account for the majority of the strokes, about 87%. Now, hemorrhages is less common, still as devastating, and uh, accounts for about 13% of the uh, strokes. In this uh, um, uh, pie, we can see that there are many causes of stroke that can be uh, detected, and this is all uh, for ischemic strokes, and this is a, um, a registry that is um, uh, from uh, Switzerland. We can see that the, the atherosclerosis accounts for a relatively small proportion the heart accounts for a proportionally much larger. But I want to bring your attention to this wedge. This about 25% uh, in, of the strokes that have an unknown cause. So these are the strokes that we thought, well, we don't know. We don't even know what they are, and we don't know how to prevent them. Now, uh, stroke, unfortunately, is, as I mentioned, very common. It's the fifth cause of death in the United States following heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and unintentional injuries. So stroke is uh, fatal. And as we can see in this next slide, in this next panel, 
that uh, the incident of incidents, uh, sorry, the deaths from stroke have declined in the last four years, but unfortunately they seem to have plateaued, suggesting there may be causes that we may not be uh, aware of and that we are not addressing. Now, unfortunately, stroke is not just the cause of death, but is a, the leading cause of serious long-term disability. And approximately 3% of men and 2% of women reported that they were disabled because of a stroke. And in the U.S., approximately uh, 800,000 people each year have a stroke. And for uh, about two-thirds of them, it represents their first cerebrovascular events. So still about 30% of these patients have a recurrent stroke. And in 2010, the estimated direct and indirect cost of stroke in the U.S. was about $74 billion. Now, to, if we want to time events, we can say that on average, every 40 seconds, someone in the U.S. has a stroke, and every four minutes, an American dies from a stroke. This is as staggering as we saw earlier from Dr. Gibson's uh, um, statistics on uh, pulmonary embolism death, and death from VTE. Now, how do we prevent stroke? Now, traditionally, reduction of stroke risk has focused on aggressive treatment of risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, smoking, uh, uh, heart, uh, other forms of heart disease. And uh, we have also prevented stroke by using antiplatelets, surgery or stenting in patients with carotid artery disease, as we mentioned with the plaque. And also with the use of anticoagulation in patients with arrhythmias, uh, such as atrial fibrillation or flutter, or cardiac disease, uh, particularly uh, uh, patients with heart failure or valvular disease. Now, uh, are we effective in reducing stroke while we uh, uh, have in the, where we intervene on risk factors? Yes, we are, and we can see that in the meta-analysis that included about four, uh, uh, 40 trials in all, almost 200,000 patients, that every time we decrease uh, blood pressure of about 10 millimeters of mercury and, uh, down to a level of 115 over 75, we reduce the risk of stroke by 33%. So blood pressure should be treated, and we see why. Also, cholesterol should be treated. And we can see here, oh, I'm sorry, this is another uh, slide that shows that why, when the more we reduce the blood pressure, we can see here the difference in blood pressure, the more we reduce the risk of stroke. But also reducing high cholesterol is effective in reducing stroke, probably because we reduce the risk of plaques. And we can see here that with all these, these are all large trials that have uh, treated high cholesterol levels. We can see that from those that had very high uh, entry levels of cholesterol to those that had very low level of cholesterol, that the percent reduction in the LDL, the lousy or bad cholesterol, is associated with the decrease of the risk of stroke. So treating cholesterol does reduce stroke. Now, we, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had been treating the uh, cholesterol, we've been treating the blood pressure, we've been treating the diabetes, but we recently have reached, reached a sort of plateau in our ability to reduce the stroke. It means that we need to find new uh, the, the causes of those unexplained strokes, and we need to find new treatments for those unexplained strokes. Now, um, Sometimes science uh, works with uh, good uh, uh, thinking in designing a clinical trial. And the designer of the uh, APEX trial that Dr. Gibson mentioned before is an example of how we can achieve uh, a better understanding of a cause of, a, of an illness and also achieve a treatment or a, for, uh, to reduce the risk of that um, uh, illness uh, uh, with a, uh, by treating a different problem. In this case, we uh, were treating as a first uh, goal of the study the, recurrence, the occurrence of um, uh, venous thromboembolic events. 
but the design of the study was smart. And we also looked at the possibility that the, the a treatment of clots in the venous system would also affect the risk of clots in the arterial system. And that's why one of the sub-studies of the APEX trial looked at the reduction of strokes. And as we can see here, there was a significant reduction of all-cause stroke in uh, the patients that were treated with betrixaban for uh, 35 days and longer versus those that were on enoxaparin for a treatment of 10 days plus of minus 4. And we can see here that there was a statistically uh, significant reduction that was driven by a reduction in ischemic stroke. Luckily, and, and as Dr. Gibson mentioned, because of the uh, property of the drug, we didn't see any increase in hemorrhagic strokes, which, uh, are, um, a, which is a sign of safety of the drug. Now, this is the slide that Dr. Gibson also showed earlier. Those patients that had the highest risk of stroke, those that had heart failure or ischemic stroke as the reason for their admission, did see the highest benefit from uh, treatment, suggesting that this is a risk factors that we should not underestimate and that we should consider as the uh, likely uh, cause of the majority of those stroke post-hospitalization. Now, um, to give a sense of the benefits from the uh, results of the APEX trial, so we know that uh, it indicates unexpectedly high rates of new recurrent ischemic stroke in patients who are, are hospitalized for medical reasons, particularly for heart failure or ischemic strokes. And these rates are even higher than those that were seen in patients with atrial fibrillation that were enrolled in trials for novel or anticoagulant. So they have higher risk than patients with atrial fibrillation. And we know that everybody uh, understands this risk in patients with atrial fibrillation. Also, it is the first study to demonstrate that a novel oral anticoagulant can reduce the risk of ischemic stroke in patients without atrial fibrillation. Now, besides the uh, Trixpan, we have evidence that also another novel oral anticoagulant can reduce the risk of stroke. In this come this, the, this data come from a very recent publication uh, uh, in the New England from the COMPASS trial that also was confirmed in another publication in, in the Lancet. And we can see that in this trial, rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared to aspirin alone led to a reduction of the main um, outcomes. And this was cardiovascular death, stroke, and uh, the uh, occurrence uh, of a, a myocardial infarction. Now, we can say, well, this was a composite endpoint. Uh, did we see a benefit also in patients with a stroke, but no, um, uh, uh, no, cardi no other cardiovascular endpoints? And if we focus on this inlet, we can see that patients that were on the rivaroxaban plus aspirin compared with those that were on, river, on aspirin alone, had a significant reduction of about 50% of ischemic stroke without an increase, a significant increase of uh, bleeding in the brain of uh, hemorrhagic strokes. So in conclusion, stroke is a major cause of disability and death worldwide with an enormous economic burden on the healthcare system. Treatment of traditional risk factors has led to a reduction of strokes, but there is an unmet need to further reduce strokes in non-traditional settings. And there is promising evidence that the use of NOAC therapy represents a leap forward in the prevention of stroke. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>